Good morning, church. Good morning. morning. I know I say this every week, but it's always great to be in the house of the Lord with you all, and and that's really going to be the focus of this morning, and we're going to continue in this series, Summer in the Psalms, uh, with what I would say is my favorite psalm. Uh, When we were planning this series, I knew uh, in my back pocket this was going to come out eventually, and, and so I don't really have a particular reason for precisely what has always drawn me to this psalm, but as I was doing uh, some studying for this morning's message, I came across somebody who described Psalm 84 as the pearl of the psalms, and I could not agree more. Uh, I feel that way, and I thought it was fitting, you know, as a title because it has a way of filling me with such encouragement and strength precisely when I need it, and so There's definitely been like numerous times in my life, you know, where (laughs) this psalm has like come into mind at at, at a moment where I didn't realize I I needed it, but because I've memorized it, right, it it comes into my mind in the midst of great difficulties as well as in the midst of great successes. And we've looked at a lot of different genres of psalms, uh, and this morning we're going to be looking at this, a psalm of praise. So before we open up God's word, I'm going to pray. Would you join me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much for your word. God, how it leads us, encourages us. God, fills us with your spirit. And God, this morning as we open up to such an encouraging psalm, God, I pray that, God, for those who need it this morning, God, that maybe at their end of their rope, God, this is precisely the thing they need from you to continue on. And so, God, just fill us with your your word this morning. Help us to be open to what it is you have to say this morning. We ask all this in your name. Amen. If you turn to Psalm 84, we're going to look at the first two verses here. It says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs. Yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. And with these beautiful opening words, we learn the truth that God's people delight to be in the house of the Lord. Really uh, profound stuff here, right? And so every week we gather here, right, on Sunday mornings to worship together. We fellowship, we encourage one another, and we pray with one another. We do this in this beautiful, right, air-conditioned building with lights and bathrooms, a gymnasium where students can play, and with more free donuts you know, than any one person really needs. We often think about how great of a joy it is, right, a privilege to be able to do this each week. And we as a pastoral staff, right, me, Luke, and Ryan, we all encourage you that you shouldn't miss out on the blessing that it is to be here with your church family. But I do want you to imagine yourself as a Jew living in this time when the psalm was written. And I'm sure there were synagogues all over Israel at the time, but the only true and proper place to worship was at the tabernacle and then later at the temple. And all Israel would come together three times a year to celebrate these mandated feasts commanded by God And for those who lived in Jerusalem, maybe that wasn't such a big deal, right? Like, you know, three times a year your city gets a little crowded, and that's that's fine. But there were pilgrims, right, who had to travel long distances to reach their destination just to be in the house of the Lord. Imagine traveling, right, for a week or more. Not in an air-conditioned car, but slowly, right, With, with a huge family, Maybe you've got a a donkey carrying some of your supplies, but you travel miles and miles in in harsh elements, right? We we got Tropical Storm Debbie, or maybe it's Hurricane by now, I don't know, but she's bearing down on us, right? Like, I don't think they have too many hurricanes over there, but, but bad weather comes up. When you finally reached Jerusalem, you would see it, right? You've had this long, arduous journey, and then you see the temple where God dwells. And that must have been an incredibly moving sight. 
And here in this psalm, we place ourselves right in, in the sandals of these pilgrims who've just caught the sight of the temple after this long journey. And they behold the place where God dwells and declare it to be lovely. How lovely is your, your dwelling place? It's not the stones, right, that, that, that made the temple beautiful, but it's the fact that God dwells there. This psalm is full of emotion, and we see that perfectly described here in verse 2. And I, I want you to notice, right, the soul, the heart, and the flesh. The psalmist, overcome with this emotion after a long journey, sees where God dwells and describes how he feels. And he said his soul longs to the point of fainting for the courts of the Lord. His heart and his flesh sing out to the living God. Every part of this pilgrim, right, whether it's physical or spiritual, is experiencing this joy, this overwhelming emotion, just from the proximity to the house of the Lord. And I'm going to be honest with you guys, right, there's, there's been many Sundays in my life where my alarm goes off and I, I go, I'm, I'm probably not ready to wake up, God. I have a little groan right? I don't know if I, I really know if it's worth it. And there's many of us, right, who would talk about how important being in the house of the Lord is, but if we're honest, sometimes other things do take the priority. The psalmist here does not sound like somebody who, who would give up, right, being in the house of the Lord for anything else. He didn't have to get up an hour before worship. He got up a week or more, right, before worship. He's been preparing for this moment for a long time. And, and I hope you don't get the impression that I'm up here trying to make you feel guilty. There was a brief time in my life where I kind of justified to myself not going to church regularly. I would still go from time to time, but like sporadically at best, I would say, and not even to the same place. I was church hopping looking for a place that would just kind of make me feel good when I, when I wanted it. But I want you to consider this morning that perhaps the blessings and true joy of being in the house of the Lord won't truly be experienced by sporadic church-hopping attendance. Does your whole self, soul, heart, and flesh long to be with God's people week in and week out? And it took a non-Christian friend of mine to point out to me that I was being a little irregular in my church attendance. He told me that in most ways, I wasn't like the other Christians he knew, right? I wasn't super hypocritical. I wasn't very judgmental. And he appreciated that about me. He, he'd grown up in the church as well and kind of rejected God. But he said, there's something different about the way I live my life. But he said, there's something that's not matching up. You're not going to church regularly. He encouraged me to find a church and just stick with it. This is a non-Christian friend of mine. Do your actions match what you profess to be lovely? If we truly find delight in being in the house of the Lord, you're going to be able to experience the blessings of being part of our church family to the fullest. Let's pick back up in verse 3. He says, Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. The truth that we see in these verses is that just to be near the house of the Lord is a blessing that brings rest brings rest. There's this amazing thing about God, right, and that he cares for the most overlooked, the least desirable, the least important. The psalmist, perhaps, now he's closer to the temple, right? He doesn't see it from afar, but he's now walking through the gates, and he notices that there's birds that have actually made their nests in the temple itself. People are constantly going, and I'm sure it's full all the time. It's a very busy place. But 
But this is where these birds have decided to, to hatch and raise their young. In tucked away places, right? Perhaps completely overlooked by most of the people who are coming in and out, these birds have made their home in the walls of the temple. And perhaps you've come here this morning and you think you've gone unnoticed. We do have an amazing uh, greeting team, right? Uh, hopefully they, they've been stationed at every door and, and you were greeted as you walked in this morning. But perhaps you were missed. Or maybe you feel like no one really knows you here that well. Or that if you stopped coming, no one would notice. Or maybe some of you feel like you don't really fit in or that others look down on you. What I want you to notice here is that these birds are finding a place of rest just by being close to the temple. We've all tried that thing, right, where you put off studying and uh, it, it's the last minute, you've got to test the next day and you, you, you're just too tired to stay up anymore, so you just fall asleep in your textbook, you know, hoping maybe through osmosis you'll get some information. It never works, right? Never works. But we do see here that just by making the house of the Lord a place that you choose to find rest, these birds are experiencing the blessing, right, that it is to be among God's people. And something that we have in common with the birds is that they like to sing, right? We, we had a great time of worship here this morning. I, I think the band did a great job and the worship team. It, those who are lucky enough, right, to dwell in the house of the Lord it says, will ever be singing his praise. And it doesn't matter what you've done, right, what your socioeconomic status is, what kind of clothing you're wearing, or even the perceived righteousness that others have of you. To find rest in the house of the Lord is to join in with the praises of the saints. It brings a blessing to all available to everyone. And here's the thing, guys, is God knows that these birds are there. He, he doesn't overlook them. He sees them. And even though you may feel overlooked, unwanted, or unclean, you can indeed find rest in the house of the Lord. As we pick up back in verse 5 here, he said, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. These are probably uh, one of the, some of the more confusing verses in this passage, uh, but as we explain what some of these, uh, these things might mean, I hope that you will see in this passage that those who trust God will arrive in the promised land. And the psalmist seems now to reflect, right? He, he's looking back on his journey. We, we saw that he kind of has seen the birds in the temple, but he's looking back. It was a long journey that was not easy. Right, as we drive around, we, we might complain about like occasional potholes or some bad drivers with road rage, right? But for the most part, traveling is not super difficult for us. When you're traveling with your whole family, the whole, whole lot of supplies, right, for a long time, it's slow and it could be dangerous, right? Like robbers on the highway aren't really a thing that we have to deal with, but they were common back then. And some pilgrims, as they traveled, would stick in these big groups, right, as, as a defensive measure, We've all been in a car, right, when like a crazy thunderstorm comes out of nowhere. Well, what happens when you don't have that metal, you know, cage to protect you? Like, it's scary. Though the destination is most certainly worth it, the journey was not for the faint of heart. And I, I remember looking back at when I became a Christian. I was only seven years old, and I can confidently say that I understood the gospel, and I don't doubt that I have my salvation. But I can just as boldly say that I had no clue what I was signing up for, right? Had no idea. And I doubt I'm alone in that, right? Like, 
perhaps you were saved much later in life. I'd, I've spoken with several of you who didn't give your life to Christ at an early age. And with all those extra years of wisdom, right? Did, did you really know what you were signing up for? No. I think that for many of us, if we truly understood the cost to follow Jesus, it would at the very least give us pause. And there are so many ups and downs, right, to the Christian life. Since I've become a Christian, I don't regret for a moment choosing to follow Jesus, but I can tell you it's not always been easy. And the pilgrims that are on this road, they had to trust that God would help them arrive at their destination. And it mentions that they go through the Valley of Baca. Um, I, I was trying to understand, where is this place, right, the Valley of Baca? And most of the commentators I read mentioned that there's, there's a lot of disagreement as to whether this is even a real place or not. So there, there's some who, who make some guesses about exactly where this valley could be. But, but the word Baca actually means weeping. And, and, and so many commentators think that this might just be a metaphor, right, for like those low times in your life that bring weeping. And there's certainly times in our lives that we could refer to as a valley of weeping. It's all the lowest times in your life. I'm not usually one to complain, right? But like, I'm not exactly in a, on a mountaintop experience recently with the, the leg situation. I've been sick the last two weeks. And, you know, we, we all have our ups and downs. But for you, that valley might be the loss of a parent. It could be that diagnosis you just got from the doctor. It could be the dissolution of your marriage. Whatever the case, all of us know what it's like to walk through this valley of Baca. How can we emerge to the other side? We see here in the psalm, right, we have to trust that God is not just in control. We say that every week, that God is in control, but, but he's also going to provide exactly what we need to get us through. And on a long journey, through an arid climate, right, that, that we know Israel to be, the most important resource you're going to need is water. You can go a long time without food, but not too long without water. Previous travelers, right, maybe have dug some wells along the way, some, some, some cisterns that could hold water. But what if the well had run dry? When we're going through the Valley of Baca on our way to Zion, God provides the needed rain. I've been reading uh, Lord of the Rings for probably the millionth time. I, I just fall asleep listening to it sometimes, but I'm actually at the part where Frodo and Sam, they're, they're trekking across Mordor, right? And, and they're trying to get to the mountain to throw in the ring. You, you know the story, but this constant dialogue between Frodo and Sam is about water. Just, they, 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 they come across, right, this like, this orc well that has like really nasty foul water in it, but it's somewhat drinkable, it's passable, right, and so they fill up, and they're like, well, we have to leave, but this isn't enough to get us to where we need to go. We just gotta go, right? We have to trust that there's gonna be something else along the way that's gonna get us there. There's certainly been times in my life where I was running out of hope. But every single time, in the nick of time, God at the last possible moment provides another source of hope. And it kind of reminds me, right, of the, of the Israelites in the desert with the manna. They could only take enough to sustain them for the day, and they'd have to trust Right, that God was going to send them more the next day so they could eat again. More would be provided. And we, like these pilgrims, have to go from strength to strength. These cisterns that have been dug and hopefully filled with water provided by God. We can go from one source of water to the next knowing that God is trustworthy. And see how verse 7 ends. It says, each one appears before God in Zion. God's not going to forget you. He's not going to leave you behind. He will provide what you need 
when you need it. But when you're in that valley, it's a lot more difficult to trust, right, that God's actually going to give you that. It's, it's hard. And the reassurance here that I'd like you to notice is that if you're on the path to Zion, you will arrive in Zion. There are many places in Scripture where the, the doctrine, right, the assurance of salvation can be found. But this one here, right, I, I love it for how it promises that God is going to let us arrive in Zion if we put our trust in him. And that's what becoming a Christian is all about, right? Placing your trust in Jesus. So when we do that, we'll be faithful to complete it in you. So take heart, right? In the midst of all those horrible circumstances, the worst things that you can go through and know that God will see you through. And, and you may think that I'm kind of like shoehorning Jesus into this passage, but I, I want you to look at these next two verses. I'm not just achieving my purpose of saying all the Psalms point to Jesus, right? That these next two verses are all about him. It says, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. This is specifically talking about Jesus, right? When we're on that difficult road with little water and threat of robbers, we're moved to pray. And that's what the psalmist does here. The psalmist points to Jesus, who is our shield, the face of his anointed. I know personally I've been moved to pray much more uh, often recently than is my, 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 my regular uh, time for prayer. And it's because right now I, I, I need God more than any time. I'm struggling, right? Like, I, it's difficult for me day in and day out, and I, I find myself moved to pray in the midst of a difficult circumstance. But God is a good God. He's a good God who's adopted me into his family. He's the father of lights. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. And if my earthly father, who, if you know him, he's an incredibly generous man, if he can shower me with gifts, how much more so my God, who knit me in my mother's womb, who died on the cross for my sins while I was still a sinner, who brought me out of the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light, Sing the song, right? Jesus is my one defense, my righteousness. And I declare in my brokenness right now, right, that I need God. Jesus has never failed to defend me. Why would he fail me now? Let's move on to verse 10. It says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God and dwell in the tents of wickedness. One of my favorite songs as I was growing up uh, in the church was, was Better is One Day. It comes directly from this song, right? Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, than thousands elsewhere. The next truth that we learn from this passage is that we are far better off as beggars in the house of the Lord than respected in the world. We tend to have a, a way of messing up our priorities, don't we? I know I do. I've been guilty of this many times. And we kind of convince ourselves that the things that we're doing are for the best. But we're often wrong. There are all sorts of positions that we can seek, popularity that we can attain, money that we can make. The list can go on and on. Pursuing these things in and of themselves is not sinful. I'm not trying to suggest that, but, but when we supplant the main thing for these secondary things, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. I remember when I was in middle school, I'd, I'd just moved to Oviedo, uh, the, the fifth grade. Didn't have like a ton of friends, uh, you know, still trying to get to know people, and I'd met a few people at the church, um, but to be honest, most of them were pretty nerdy and uh, not really all that popular. I, I did meet a few other kids at school, uh, not necessarily Christians, right? And I, I remember how they used to make fun 
of some of those kids from the church. And for a while, I pretended that I didn't know those people, right? Like, yeah, I see them on Sundays, and we'll hang out then, but pretty much wouldn't spend much time with them. I didn't want to lose my cooler friends to defend my unpopular ones. And, and one day, I really couldn't take it anymore. I, I kind of felt guilty, right? And I felt like a bit of a fraud as a Christian, so I picked up my lunch tray, right? This is middle school Nick. Pick up my lunch tray. I'm not going to sit with these cool people anymore. I'm going to go sit with my church friends who get made fun of every day. I kind of gave up my path to this popularity to go and hang out with the weird kids. And for you, it may be that you're just trying to provide for your family. And that's a good thing, right? But the amount of money that you make has grown considerably over time. And maybe you're no longer sure if it's really about providing for your family, but maybe being respected. Or maybe you've made some compromises, right, that have allowed you to climb this ladder. But something is gnawing at your soul, knowing that the compromises should never have been made. And here in this psalm, we see two kinds of people. One is dwelling in the tents of wickedness. It's probably respected, wealthy, powerful. And on the other side, you have a doorkeeper. It's not a particularly high position to be a doorkeeper. It's not very respected. But we learn that just one day, of being able to peek through the door as the least important person in the house of the Lord is better than a thousand in the other guy's shoes, right? To be able to catch a glimpse, right? To eat the smallest morsel, to hear just for a moment, well done, good and faithful servant, is worth more than all the compromises we could ever make. And this goes back to Psalm 1 in the first week when Ryan talked to us, right? There's two paths. You, there's a person who is walking in the counsel of the wicked. And there are those who are planted like a tree by streams of water. Which path do you want? So we look at the last verses here and close out Psalm 84 starting in verse 11. It says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. And to me, these are some of the most encouraging words in all of Scripture. And we learn in these verses the truth that God bestows favor and honor through his son Jesus who illuminates and protects us. M- many ancient civilizations uh, worshipped the sun, right? The S-U-N, like the Egyptians with Ra or the, the Greeks with Apollo. It's curious then, right, to see this phrase, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. We'll come back to the shield in just a second here, but what's going on here? Is there some like weird Jewish syncretism going on, mixing worship of God with the sun? We know full well from Scripture, right, that the sun is a created object. Perhaps one of the most brilliant, right, stunning, dazzling, but it's still a creation of God. And the psalmist is not squinting at the sun, right, trying to see if he can make out the shape of God up there. He's pointing to the sun as a metaphor for the way that God illuminates. He not only illuminates by bringing physical, right? right? Like, yes, God did create the sun. He's, He's given us the light that we have to see. But he also shines a light on our sins. And we see that in the end, Right? As you, as you read through Revelation, there's no need for an S-U-N, the sun, because the sun, the S-O-N, provides all the light that we need. He's the light of the world. 
Sin often takes place in the darkness, but bringing them out into the light is a purifying process, right? Far fewer crimes happen in the daylight hours. And our God provides the light we need in our life to guide us on the highways that lead to Zion. It says here that he's also our shield. And guys, Jesus quite literally died in your place. He stood in your place and received the punishment you deserve to shield you from the second death. And you placed your trust in him. He's placed his spirit within you to guide you, right? To steer you away from pitfalls and snares. His shield will not let the enemy's darts reach you. You are safe when you rest behind the shield of Jesus. But we see here, he doesn't just shield us. He bestows favor and honor. What right do we have to these things? Absolutely none. But he gives them to us nonetheless. My favorite part of the psalm, right, is this promise that God's not going to withhold anything good from those who walk uprightly. You ever feel like all your best efforts go wasted, right, that nobody is going to notice? I know I often feel that way, right? But notice here that God had made a promise. Anytime God makes a promise, you can take it to the bank. My biggest problem with this promise is the knowledge that none of us are righteous. No, not one. Right? Only Jesus' is righteousness applied to our lives can make us righteous. All my best efforts are filthy rags. But when I trust in Jesus alone for my salvation, when I'm following him, all sorts of blessings are going to follow. And so the psalm ends, right, by declaring that blessed is the one who trusts in God. And I don't know about you, but I could sometimes use the encouragement that this psalm brings. There's so many times in my life where I feel like I'm in a valley or that I'm going unnoticed or that I don't have the, the worldly respect that I feel like I deserve. But then this psalm reminds me that Jesus has provided everything I need exactly when I need it and that no one or nothing can keep me from the blessings that he has in store for me when I trust him. And perhaps you don't know him. Right? Perhaps you, you're sitting in this room and you don't trust him in that way. This morning, I do, I do pray that you'll place your faith in Jesus and trust him. And if you can do that, I promise you, you can take it to the bank that you will arrive in Zion, right? That, that you will spend eternity in heaven with him. You're, re- you're going to reach your destination because he's a son of and a shield. And no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Will you pray with me?